In only his second year as Denver's head coach, Mike Shanahan guided the 1996 Broncos to the best record in the NFL. We knew coming in we had the makings of a very good football team. I don't think we thought that we're going to be 13 and 3, but everything kind of fell into place. Like anything, once you start rolling, and we started rolling, and we didn't look back. We knew we had some weapons, and that's the fun. That was the fun part about being on a team that you can count on a number of players. There wasn't just one guy who was carrying the whole team the entire season. Having those options and knowing that we had the the guys with the with the killer mentality, it's a beautiful thing in football. It's beautiful. Elway hands off Davis right side. Big hole. Davis over the 35. Oh, he might be on. We knew we played our game, we're going to put 30 on it. If we had a B-plus ball game, that was 28 points. We had an A-plus ball game, we are going to hang mid-30s, maybe even 40-plus points on you. So we were a very, very confident football team. I'm calling the president. President, we need a National Guard. We need as many men as you can spare, because we are killing the Patriots. So call the dogs off. Send the National Guard, please. They need emergency help, please. Denver's most prominent figure remained John Elway. The aging quarterback was running out of time, trying to reach the one milestone that had eluded him for 13 NFL seasons. And that's why near the end of my career, it wasn't that much fun because I knew anything I did, the only the bottom line is everything would go back to the fact that I hadn't won a Super Bowl. So for me to legitimize in everybody's mind about my career, I had to win a Super Bowl, and that was my mission. Numbers didn't matter. Touchdown passes didn't matter. All that mattered to me was getting the best seating for the playoffs and win a Super Bowl, because that's the only thing for me that I had left to do. Denver secured the division title and home field advantage in early December. With the playoffs more than a month away, Mike Shanahan dialed down the intensity for the remaining games on the schedule. The game plan was pretty vanilla. They said the things you gotta say to keep your team right, but we can just tell this isn't a regular game plan that we've been having. This is a game plan to get us through this game. <laughs> Several starters had their playing time reduced or did not suit up at all. I don't think we looked at it from the standpoint of, hey, we're gonna make sure we take care of everybody. We're gonna, you know, lovingly wrap them up in bubble paper and make sure we put them on the shelf for a while. I think it was more of a necessity than it was anything else. We had a lot of guys that were really banged up at that point in time. I can remember questions on guys like Gary Zimmerman who played with a bad shoulder the majority of the season that year. You know, when I look back on some of those decisions we made on some of those players, I think we'd probably make them again. At that time, I think we were doing what was best for our football team, and we as coaches all agree with Mike. You know, I've been in this thing for 23 years, and I've had that opportunity probably about 14, 15 times with a lot of different organizations having a chance to have success. I felt very good about the decision. Denver's return to good health came at a price. The Broncos appeared lethargic in losing two of their final three regular season games. We really didn't have anything to play for. You're so far in front. What is the reward? You already have home field clinched throughout the playoff. You've already won the division. There's really nothing to gain. Maybe we did lose some of the cohesiveness, but that was a chance Mike was willing to take. Resting players was not a luxury enjoyed by the second-year Jacksonville Jaguars. A struggling team looking for both wins and its own identity. We were trying so hard to not be labeled as an expansion team. We wanted to be known as the Dallas Cowboys or the Green Bay Packers, team with history, but we had no history. By late November, the 96 Jaguars found themselves near the bottom of the AFC Central. And it's caught out of the air, Jerry Ball! Score, no that season, we had a lot of talent, but we had a lot of young talent. I know that we started three, three uh, rookies on defense with myself, Tony Brackens, and Aaron Beasley. You know, that's a young football team, and so we made some mistakes. There were four games lost by a total of 14 points. A lot of really close games that, you know, I remember we made a mistake in a formation. You know, those kinds of things. Block is running. Mark Brunel cannot get it off. Brunel can't get it off. 
we felt that we were letting a few slip away. And so it was real frustrating because we felt we were better than four and seven. We knew our hopes for the playoffs were very slim because we would have had to win out at four and seven and still get still get a few breaks. And so it's pretty frustrating at that point. We lost to some teams that really put a damper on the season and really had people not wanting to come to work the next week. I mean, there was almost a revolt in the locker room in 96 because everybody was sick and tired of Coughlin at, you know, at that point. Because he can grind you now. It's not tough enough for you, huh? Well, we can do something about that. We can do something about that. There was a point where Tom Coughlin was either going to make it and be considered a really good coach or be considered tyrant Tom and ways just weren't going to work in the National Football League. I didn't know which way it was going to go. You know, there was a lot of players that were really unhappy. There's some players only meetings where we decided, hey, we're in a bad place, and uh, let's just each one of us do what we can to turn this thing around. We won a game. We tried to build on that. We did, and pretty soon we started winning some football games. We got a little momentum going, which was nice, and we can kind of feel everything change. And I think being four and seven, I think Tom almost took the pressure off a little bit. But I think that's when Tom was at his best. And I've got great respect for Tom Coughlin. Probably one of the best coaches I've ever played for in my career. Hey, was there any doubt who that game was for? Something that Coach Coughlin did to us, I don't know what it was, but it was like we were zombies out there. We were so focused on getting our job done, we couldn't be beat. Quick drop down from now, five steps, seven steps, looking long into the end zone. Jimmy Smith racing down. Smith makes the catch on the Carroll touchdown! Coughlin's club carried a four-game win streak into the final week. A victory over the lowly Falcons would put Jacksonville in the playoffs. But a second half Atlanta rally threatened to ruin the Jaguars' Cinderella season. You're sitting there thinking, you know, here we come from being terrible, knowing who we are, and, and now we work ourselves in a position to go to the playoffs, and we all we have to do is beat a team that wasn't very good that year, and we're blowing it. They got us on the ropes. I don't know how many seconds left in the game, and you got probably one of the greatest kickers of all time in Morton Anderson lining up to kick a game-winning field goal. The Jaguars' playoff hopes may indeed rest on this play. It is from 31 yards. There's the snap. The place with the kick is up. It's on the way. And it's no good. It's no good. Oh, my God. It's no good. Oh, my God. Best. And the Jaguars are going to the playoffs. Oh, my goodness. Missed the field goal. You know, I mean, should I jump for joy or should I just, you know, be thankful in my own way that we're in the playoffs and we have this next opportunity coming? Having overcome the adversity to get to this spot only makes us stronger. Now, we got an opportunity now to do something about this playoff thing. And we're going to, we're not going to be just happy to be in here now. We're in this thing to win. That's right. That's we're right. in this thing to win. These young guys, these jazz boys been talking a lot of noise. They like they've been to leave for about 10, 12 years. Just as quick as they got in, as quick as they got to get their out. I remember everyone saying that the Bills had not lost a playoff game at home. That helped us because everybody said, hey, you know, you don't got a shot. You should be happy to be in the playoffs. And so I think guys went up there and said, hey, we're just going to play. And then all of a sudden we get into the playoffs and Nate John Means has maybe the best games of his career. He broke a lot of tackles and turned some three-yard gains into 40-yard plays.
Going into their first meaningful game in more than a month, the Denver Broncos were eager to regain the winning form that had propelled them to the league's best record. We were in a groove, and we were clicking on all cylinders. And when you cut that back, you know, it takes a while to get back to where you were. And it's not that we didn't get focused and Mike didn't do a great job of homing us in. I really think when you come down to it, going into that playoff game, it was no fear. Yeah, it, we really never thought Jackson was going to beat us. We really, it, it was no fear. And I think a little fear is good. We felt as though it was our year. And the way the season played out, we thought it was going to be in the Super Bowl. And I need to just go out there and get it. And I'm trying to... But at least one Bronco was feeling apprehensive as Denver prepared for the Jaguars. And he shared those fears with his wife one evening after finishing practice. Well, I came home. It was either a Thursday or a Wednesday night. I said, this game plan is so convoluted, and it's so not us, and we're in shotgun all the time, and we're spreading out four and five wides. It wasn't who we were. This isn't our identity. This isn't how we got to this point. I hated the game plan. I hated its complexities. I hated what it was all about. And yeah, I did. I came right home and said, I told my wife, point blank, we're going to lose this game. While Schlereth could not shake his sense of dread, veteran Jaguar center Dave Wydell, number 79, was eager to reconnect with some of his longtime buddies. Of course, Dave Wydell, this was a huge game to Dave. Dave had played in Denver. Dave and his brother both, you know, the greatest holders in the, in the history of the game. But Dave, Dave's making his return. That's uh, nice. We'll retire in the same year. Sounds Three, good. four, five years on the road. There you go. See what I did. Jacksonville entered the game as the biggest playoff underdog since the New York Jets in Super Bowl III. But the Jaguars weren't in awe of the odds or their opponent. I thought we was out of it. We still in it, baby. All day long, all day long, baby. You guys ready? 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 Yeah, yeah we ready. We went into that football game not having, uh, you know, a lot of expectations. I mean, because everybody, you know, thought that uh, we didn't have a chance. Uh, you know, we were a 14-point uh, uh, underdog, and so it was no pressure. I didn't care that we were 14-point underdogs. In fact, the points didn't even come into my mind, at least, until that morning when I picked up the paper and Woody Page wrote the article, the famous article here about us being the Jaguars. Woody Page, you know, he had this big thing about the Jaguars and who are these guys coming into our time. All of that played into the story. It was just like a, a fairy tale, like a storybook. It's a beautiful day. Not a cloud in the sky. It's a good day for Jaguar weather. I'm going to wake up in the morning of the game and have an article that a lot of people were going to take offense to. I mean, you couldn't, have, you couldn't ask for anything better than that. Thank you, Woody. Appreciate it. <laughs> we're here to play. Here to play. We're for real. Time to prove it. Time to prove it. What time is it? Game time! What time is it? Game time! What time is it? Game time! Game time! Game time! Game time! Game time! Coming up, the opening kickoff of the 1996 AFC Divisional Playoff. Let's Everybody. go, buddy. Pride, I'm free. One, two, three, pride! At 5,280 feet above sea level, Mile High Stadium, ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to rumble! Kick comes down short. To Ricky Bell, caught the sun. It's Bucky Brooks, a former Buffalo Bill, across the 27-yard line. The Jaguars send out Mark Brunel. After waiting a month to cheer for their team in a meaningful game, the Mile High faithful were in full voice for the Jaguars' opening drive. Brunel was hoarse through the course of this week with loud noise played in the Jaguar practices for this reason. Listen to the game. Lost the yard, flags fly, delay of game. 
Jacksonville's offense misfired badly during its first possession and was off the field barely a minute into the game. The Bronco defense doing exactly what they wanted to early, establishing themselves, forcing the Jaguars to a three and out. He came out in the gap, and then we had Michael Ding right here tilted in the gap. Right, so it was, 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 was a trip. Hey, all three guys were covered the middle, right? John Elway was eager to get the Broncos out of the gate quickly and did so by taking a do-it-yourself approach. Spanish. This hand's going to go. Oh, is it in? Bounds across the 45. He's there for a stand. I played against Marino and Kelly, some great quarterbacks, uh, but John Elway was by far the superior athlete in my mind. And so even though Terrell Davis was the talk, I knew ultimately that was John Elway's team and that we would have to find a way to slow down John Elway. And the Broncos showing how successful they've been on opening drives. That's part of that scheme of scripting the plays. Mike Shanahan bowed from San Francisco. Complete to Dwayne Carswell, the tight end, toppled by Aaron Beasley. Mike Shanahan in his second year. This, interestingly, he has one less playoff game as head coach than Tom Coughlin. This is his first, and Coughlin, of course, last week with a win at Buffalo. On third down, Shanahan made a perfect play call that yielded less than perfect results. Shannon Sharp, the throw was a little low, and Sharp appeared to kick it out of his own grasp with a knee. Right, you got to make that catch. And Shannon Sharp's had an excellent year, but had the ball hit him right below the belt. L.A. had what he wanted. Denver lost its chance to score early, but the Jaguars suffered an even greater loss. Mark Brunel's security blanket and the anchor of Jacksonville's offensive line. Dave Waddell, the starting center for the Jaguars, with a uh, strained calf. But for the time being, Michael Cheever, the backup center, is in the game for Jacksonville. We saw Michael Cheever have two starts this year and did have some trouble with the snaps with Mark. This noise will make a real difference now. You get very worried about that stuff because you're with a guy that you've taken very few snaps from. So it's in the back of your mind, hey, i got to get the snap. And normally you wouldn't think about that. Dave and I had worked together quite a bit that season. Executing the center snap was the least of the Jaguars' problems. Their second series was even shorter than their first, and with the same dismal results. A poor punt put Denver at midfield, an ideal location for the Broncos to kickstart their powerful ground game. You know, I think the teams who can run the ball in the playoffs are the teams that ultimately are going to win that championship. And that's all we followed through the, through the playoffs was just make sure that we got good positive yards on runs and make sure we uh, kept our offense on the field and our defense off the field. Oh, he got a great block from Aaron Traver. And Terrell Davis hit the seam just to toss strong side, short side of the field. Denver picked up 47 yards on the Davis run. Gaining the last two yards would prove far more difficult. Davis now gets the ball, first and goal, and he has not quite knocked it in. Second and goal. The ball lurches for it and didn't quite get the ball. Davis now lined up behind Elway. Terrell Davis stacked up. He does not get in. You got to go for it. You're inside the one yard line. I don't think you can give Jacksonville any idea if they can stop your offense. Plus, there's an injured Bronco player, that's and that's Davis. Terrell Davis. And now the trainers are helping him to his feet. So we will likely see Terrell Davis back in the game. And on Hebron will check in as his replacement. Fourth and goal. They line up with Vaughn Hebron. It was actually a play put in that week. It was kind of like a wedge, and you come right off his butt, and I was able to get a little crease and score the first playoff touchdown. Very happy with that. as Terrell Davis, but Hebron, the former Virginia Tech star, slams it in, and Denver has the first score. 
The Broncos had labored mightily for their touchdown. And the Jaguars didn't concede any ground on the conversion attempt that followed. Jason Elam for the extra point, and no good. It was touched in there by Clyde Simmons. Good penetration, and Elam never did really get it away, and it's only six to nothing. He had a streak of 46 out of 46 this year. In a less hostile environment, the blocked extra point might have inspired the lethargic Jacksonville offense. But the Jaguars continued to play the role of two touchdown underdogs. And I think that first, those first three series, uh, at least a, maybe a quarter, a quarter and a half, we didn't do a thing. That first quarter was ugly. It kind of went like a lot of people expected, maybe some of us. After another three and out disaster, the humble Jaguars limped off while the confident Broncos continued to move with power and precision. What we wanted the West Coast offense to be is, we're going to pound you. We're going to hurt you. We're going to run the football. We're going to get on the backside. We're going to get on your legs. We're going to make sure that you have to get up off the ground and chase plays. But we're going to be a physical group. We're going to come out, and we're going to establish the run. This West Coast offense was predicated on being physical, running the football, pounding the rock down your throat, and then setting up the passing game off of that. I think as a defense in that game, we didn't have a whole lot of confidence. Because if we'd stacked the box to stop Trell Davis, John would eat us up. You know, what are we going to do? It took Denver just six plays to reach the red zone. From there, all-pro tight end Shannon Sharp more than made up for his earlier dropped pass. I remember having the guard standing sharp. I had help over the top, but it was like he ran by me, and I'm, I'm running to catch up. I turned, and I saw Elway still had the ball, but before I know it, Shannon Sharp had the ball. We mentioned that he's spreading it around. That was his sixth completion, his sixth different receiver. And now, because of the blocked extra point on their first score, they'll go for two. From the shotgun with Craver and Davis. Was open. John threw the ball a little behind me, but it's a play that I know I should have made. They have to feel really good. Here they are, they've given up two touchdowns, they blocked the PAT, and then we failed to convert on a two-point conversion. I think they got a little confident after that. First quarter, they're up 12 to nothing on us. We haven't done anything. We've done nothing more but give it back to them, and they're at least two to one with us in time of possession. So we're just thinking that, you know, we've got to make something good happen. First of all, we've got to have some points. After running two unsuccessful plays, the Jaguars began the second quarter on the verge of yet another disheartening three and out series. We didn't get a first down until the second quarter until they decided to throw the ball to me. Ironically, I had led the lead that year in third down catches for first down. When they decided to throw the ball, they threw the ball to me on a simple out route, and I tight roped the sideline. Had it been another two inches, it would have been out of bounds, and it would have been a first down. Who knows what would have happened. So fortunately, that play ignited a lot of other things. We didn't just line up in our conventional formations because the first three times we did, they kicked us in the teeth and shut us down pretty effectively. But once we went to those different formations, it gave us a chance to get the running game going and maybe take advantage of the fact that we thought we were a little bit bigger and stronger than they were. We always wanted to run the ball and keep us in a down and distance that was manageable. Right on line, take control of this thing. By switching to multiple tight end sets, the Jaguars began to move the football effectively. There was notable success up the middle, where rookie center Michael Cheever, number 63, was finding his comfort zone as Dave Wydell's replacement. We had a ton of confidence in Michael Cheever. He was a guy who got drafted high, I believe he was a second round draft pick out of Georgia Tech, and, and was super athletic and smart and had a composure about him beyond his years. 
The great thing about Michael Cheever was that he went in the game and the game continued. It, you know, he was, the game wasn't bigger than the kid. The kid went in and he played and played well. The drive did not result in a touchdown. But it did quiet the crowd, slow Denver's momentum, and earn the Jaguars some badly needed points. So Mike Hollis comes on. This will be a long field goal try for Jacksonville. A 46-yard attempt. And Idaho gets a good boot into this one. It is good. Well into the screen. And Jacksonville on the board. The Jaguar offense got another chance to trim the lead a few minutes later. The Broncos figured the best way to prevent further damage was to turn up the heat on Mark Brunel. Denver's defense brought the house to the Jaguars pass pocket. And the results were what appeared to be a game-changing play. Whistle dead. As the flag goes down, and James may have been guilty of a foul in order to pick off that ball. The Tory James interception by far was a big turning point in that ball game. Thank goodness there's no instant replay. You know, that game could have been over if, if that interception stood. Uh, we got lucky. Got lucky on that one. This is an unbelievably bad call. Defensive backs are entitled to the ball as much as a receiver. I don't see how they call pass interference. I don't see what the back judge saw. I don't. And when you're a good football team, you make your own breaks. But I think I'll go to my grave believing that Torrey James did not interfere with that guy. The ruling deflated Denver and gave Jacksonville new life. Now it was the Jaguars who were dominating the game. We would always teach the back when he went to the flat that if he didn't get the ball, as soon as the quarterback took his eyes off him and went to the inside to look, to turn up. And we could hit Natron down the sidelines against Bill Romanowski. We didn't really expect it. We've done it before during the season, but that was an enormously uplifting play for us just to see Natron because he was not, that wasn't his area of expertise. Romanowski's mistimed coverage helped Jacksonville convert a critical third down play. But the Jaguars were far from finished, tormenting the Broncos' veteran linebacker. Brunel operates from the shotgun, and here comes Romanowski. They lift him and guns complete. It is Willie Jackson for a first down inside the 20. Boy, did Mark Brunel just put a move on Bill Romanowski. Faked him out of his job. Atwater makes the stop after a 20-yard game. What we're seeing Mark do in this drive is really show some savvy in the pocket. He's not so quick to run out of there. He's hanging in there, taking the licks, but he's just taking a half a step or a shoulder move here or a head move here to throw that rushing defender off, giving himself time to throw. I tell you, Brunel just played with him and then threw a dart 20 yards down the field. And the Jaguars doing what they want to do. They're controlling the clock, controlling the ball. They started this back at their 20-yard line, their first and 10 of the Broncos 16. So the Jaguars trailing only 12-3. Metron Means banging inside the 10-yard line. They're starting to wear down this Bronco defense and show that they can move the ball in key situations. As the game went on, I think they made some adjustments. And I don't know if we made those same adjustments. I don't think we adjusted to their adjustments um, because they, they seemed to get an edge, and we, we couldn't seem to make the plays. Means again. Steps away from the tackle, and Means will score. Yeah! They tried to be up into the middle, being patient, not throwing his head in there. He read the blocks, bounced outside, coming up with the big touchdown run. An 80-yard drive for the Jaguars, and they're in this game. They're hanging around. Broncos have really let them off the hook. Might have happened a little too easily for Denver off the top of those two touchdowns. Let's see if they can get it back. Daddy, way to go, baby. 
Way to go, babe. Way to go. Nate, 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 Nate,
it was anything that they were doing that we hadn't practiced or we hadn't seen. We just couldn't figure out what was going on with that game. They went from bad to worse real quick <laughs> in the third quarter. Hollis sends it into the shadows of the northern end of Mile High. Vaughn Hebron, 25, 30, sees the scene. One man to beat, and Hollis is able to trip him up. The flag is down. Yeah. Yeah. This is coming back. They were going to have the ball at about midfield. Now they'll be backed up to, I'm guessing, close to their 20, if not inside. Here's the return. Holden, number 94 by the receiver. That would have been a great way to start the second half, saying, look, get momentum, hopefully get an early score, and now we put them back on their heels. And, you know, you look back again, so many plays that can change, you know, the state of a game, but anytime you can come out and put your team on the 48-yard line, that's big time. We came out and executed, and you have a holding call. Took all that away. The Broncos' offense continued to struggle on their first two possessions of the second half. They ran 14 plays and gained only 37 yards. More surprising was Denver's approach. 12 of the 14 plays had John Elway in the shotgun. This was not the same offense that produced 1,500-yard rusher Terrell Davis. It wasn't who we were. This isn't our identity. This isn't how we got to this point. This isn't how we went 13-3. and three. Jacksonville didn't take us out of running the football. We took ourselves out of running the football. We took ourselves out of establishing who we were. We took ourselves out of our own identity. Sometimes you can get too cute in a ball game, uh, and, and you try to catch a team off balance and say, okay, this is what they're expecting. This is what we're going to do. But I'm a firm believer. I'm going to do what got me to this point. I'm going to dance with the girl. I took to the dance. Now, I know there was, might be someone else better looking, but she did go with me, so I'm going to stick with her. And I thought we should have stuck with TD a little more. It's easy to look back and say you should have done this or you should have done that. You know, the bottom line is you either get it done or you don't get it done. I think we had a pretty poor game plan, to be honest with you. Too much of the shotgun formation. While Mike Shanahan's sense of perspective revealed a crack in the Broncos' offensive identity, the Jaguars remained true to theirs. They featured a heavy dose of 240-pound Natron knees. First possession, second half, Natron breaks the tackle. 35, and Natron knees has a first down at the 37-yard line. We knew we had to have balance, and we knew we had to stick with the run, whether we were having a lot of success or not. Natron got the good, tough yards, got some yards after first contact that he'd been doing, you know, that whole year for us. We thought we could be physical with him. We felt we had a big offensive line. We were physical. We felt we could get after him, that we could get going downhill on them and, uh, and, and start to put some wear and tear on them as the game went on, and, and we were going to stick with it. I think we did a good job in running the ball so that we stayed in. We weren't in a lot of third and 15s, which uh, no matter how good a play call you are, those those are the ones you want to stay away from. We stayed in down and distance situations that were very reachable. Third and three, quick pass complete to Willie Jackson. Jackson still alive and finally down at the 33-yard line. Mark saw the blitz, stood up and hit Willie for a 12-yard gain in the and first, the first down. down. Big Willie third down play. Made a big catch. Both wide receivers to the right. Pete Mitchell lined up on the left. And now McCardell in motion. Going long for McCardell. Touchdown. If they call it, was he in bounds? No call yet. They look at each other, the two officials, no signal. It's touchdown. It was a specific play which called for a, a specific pattern. Well, Mark, as he always was able to do, he, he felt pressure and he was able to maneuver and move, and Keenan was smart enough and knew our scramble rules. There's our scramble rules, and then there were there was uh, Keenan's scramble rules. <laughs> Keenan had the opportunity, he was going to go towards the end zone. The throw was amazing. No one talks about the throw that Mark Brunel, uh, th that he made that day. The throw was perfect. Keenan didn't have to do anything but throw his hands up and catch the football and keep his feet in bounds, which that's what he does best. Touchdown, Jackson! 
Jacksonville. Touchdown, Jacksonville. 31 yards from Mark Brunel to Keenan McCardo. Touchdown, Jacksonville. It really was a great throw by Brunel and a great catch by Keenan McCardo because Lionel Washington was all over him. He was able to make the catch and get his feet in. I mean, it was a very small window that he could have gotten that ball in. Brunel going outside the pocket and throwing the ball over the top, and we got perfect coverage. It might not be our day because look at the touchdown of the catch. It wasn't like they're wide open. I mean, we had blanketed coverage. Mark Brunel to Keenan McCardell completed Jacksonville's fourth consecutive scoring drive. Midway through the third quarter, the Jaguars had captured an eight-point lead. Four twenty-three to go in the third quarter, and the crowd trying to get the defense jacked up a little bit. Jaguars twenty, Broncos twelve. Jacksonville will start this possession first and ten on their eight, and they are in front of the south stands. The hot team, six wins in a row. Hot here in Denver. Last four possessions, four scores, twenty unanswered points. Natron. He gets only to the ten-yard line. One of the recurring themes throughout the game was third down conversions. While the Broncos struggled, Jacksonville was efficient. Third down and eight. Means. Okay, a tackle. He rumbles out across the 25-yard line. What a great call by Kevin Gilbride. Again, they draw it down. 14 carries, 117 yards. Another big third down conversion. The Jaguars now four in a row. A third down conversion. What I always tried to do as a play caller was uh, we always wanted to achieve balance, the best of our ability. We ran our trap game. It wasn't always necessarily as by design, but because of the slanting and angling they did, we wound up running back door on the trap play. Now, I had not called the trap in a game more than once or twice the entire season. We wound up running seven or eight times in that game. and. I think six of the seven times that we ran it hit it back door and, and were, were good gains for us. While the Jaguars were outstanding on third down, it was a failed conversion that resulted in one of the game's defining moments. Jacksonville is five for nine on third downs today. You know, looking for the quick pass, and then goes long in the man. Out of bounds is Willie Jackson. He's open again behind him. So the punt by Brian Barker, a flag down. Beautiful kick. Brad Smith, third catch at the seven-yard line. 50-yard punt, no return. Will it count? On the kick, there were 12 men on the defense, number 95. Did not get off the field. It's a five-yard penalty. First down. That 12 guys out on a punt team in a crucial situation is unforgivable as well. You got that right. What a crucial penalty against the Broncos. A mental mistake by a veteran football team. Michael Dean knew that he should have run off the field and is a little down and dejected and walked off the last five yards and it cost us a penalty. You know, something that, uh, you know, you can't tolerate. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thank you for that. The penalty by Michael Dean Perry prolonged Jacksonville's possession and led to another critical third down. This one from the Broncos' 38-yard line. Well, the Broncos probably have not had a bigger play this year. They're down by eight. Third down and seven. Under pressure. Running right by a tackler goes James Stewart. Stewart on the run to the 15 and out of bounds inside the red zone of the Jaguars to the 13-yard line. Bill Romanowski is there, but he just gets blocked and nobody else around Stewart as he caught the ball. Tony Baselli, an excellent block on Romanowski. It was 560 slip screen left, and it's a little quick screen to the tailback out. It's third and long. My job is to act like I'm blocking Alford and get him to rush hard up the field and throw him up the field and then turn right away and find the first linebacker. Well, I got the guy up the field, but they were man-to-man, -man, so Romanowski had James Stewart man-to-man. -man. And so as soon as I turned to look, figure out where the linebacker was that was responsible, he was on top of me. 
And so literally, I remember just the flash of him being there and me diving and pushing him wide and James being able to sneak up, up underneath my block. Tony Baselli did a great job. It was just a big, big momentum game. Because they, they knew they, they, they were really struggling stopping us. They finally had his third and seven or eight, and we were able to make that critical third down conversion. And it just continued the momentum that we had already been building up. This has become a shocking game. Eight-point lead well into field goal range. Now it's James Stewart again. And he's to the nine-yard line before Lodish can make the stop. And that's not good news. The top tackler in the secondary for the Broncos, pro bowler Steve Atwater, went so. I had a deep dive bruise, and I stayed out and I played a couple of plays. And then when I went to the sideline and got off the field, it just tightened up, seemed like all the blood went there, and I couldn't even bend my leg. I felt like you know, I let, let my team down, not being able to be there uh, in a crucial situation. How about this drive? This will be play number 15. It's taken seven minutes off of the game clock. The game had now moved into the fourth quarter. Three James Stewart runs left Jacksonville with a fourth and one from the Denver four-yard line. I don't think there'll be any decision here. I think they'll kick it. Here comes Mike Hollis to try his third field goal of the game. Take the field goal, make it 11 pointer. Hollis from 22. He's got it. He's three for three. The Jaguars extend their lead 23-12. Obviously, we were pretty thrilled, uh, but at the same time, we were very aware of who was on the other side of the ball, their quarterback. And time and time again, you know, as you know, just about all of, all of us, you know, growing up, we had seen him come back from games like that. There was never a game that I went into where I didn't think John could pull it out in the fourth quarter. I mean, he had that kind of demeanor. He just exuded confidence when he walked in the huddle. You got number seven in the backfield. You feel pretty good about your chances of, of making a comeback. 10.51 left in the year for the Broncos, unless they can mount a comeback. If you need a fourth quarter comeback, there's the man. John Elwood. He the sticks, that will be close to a first down, depending on the mark at the 48, 47-yard line. Second and one as we approach the 10-minute mark. the 36-yard line. John Elway. In his 14th season, with time both insistent and unrelenting, needed yet another command performance. Third down and eight for Elway. Shot down. Luke Smith. Ryan Smith. Luke's out of the top. First down, Denver. Big play, third and six. Clyde Simmons back in for Jacksonville. Of my high school, we like, okay, we fired now. We're gonna reel them in and we're gonna find a way. We, we just knew it. There was never any question in any of our minds that we we're gonna find a way to fight back and win that football game. Coming up, the fourth quarter magic belongs to Mark Brunel, not John Elway. Mark put on a clinic that day, and he was something special. DCTD, what he did? The promise of another John Elway comeback filled Mile High Stadium. The burden was clearly on the Jaguars' offense. Seven and a half minutes ago in the fourth quarter, we were up 23-20. 
We knew that we weren't going to win the game if we didn't put the ball in the end zone. I grew up in Denver. I remember the drive against the Browns. Not only once, but twice of taking their heart at the end of the game. And all of a sudden, Elway decided it was time to turn it on and would put the whole team on his back and take a sure defeat to victory. And I just said, boy, I don't want to be the, I don't want to be on the other side of this one. My thinking was influenced not just by his reputation, but unfortunately by an experience I had had a couple years earlier in the playoff game with Houston against him. Say what you want to. I don't think I want anybody back there except He went 98 seven. yards against us. I think he scrambled on two or three times on fourth down to keep their drive going and beat us. With one of their greatest come from behind. So in the back of my mind, I was saying, we can't just run off time. A lot of people say, oh, just be conservative, just run off time. That, that wasn't going to get it done. So I knew we had to not only run off time to help the defense, but we had to score again. They've scored every possession since the first quarter, Jacksonville. Means. Big power back, able to manage only a yard. Listen to this crowd. Slides at the 40-yard line. Hawk there to cover him. First down. The Jaguars continued to give the ball to Natron Means, and he delivered. But it was Mark Brunel, with just over four minutes remaining, who crafted the kind of late-game improvisation strongly reminiscent of John Elway. Second and nine. Four and a half minutes left. Trying to keep the ball away from Elway. Brunel slips away. What a move. Still on his feet to the sidelines of the 40. Another block. Brunel 30, 25, and dives at the 21. Oh, my. What a Mark Brunel with a masterful run of 29 yards. It was covered, or at least I thought the routes were covered. I uh, took off, I had a nice block, um, got up through the line, cut to the left, and got around a few guys. It just came at the right time, we needed it. It was pretty cool, and I think after that play, I remember thinking, hey, we, you know, we score here, we got this thing. You know, we were getting pretty excited. It was a big run, it was a big play, and we put ourselves in a position to go up quite a bit, you know, enough to secure the game. The guy was exciting to watch. He was 26 years old at the time. You know, he was their franchise quarterback. He could move, he could run. The guy was amazing in that game. He out John Elway, John Elway, and they out Bronco the Broncos. It really came down to us moving the ball. We had a great scramble by Brunel, which led to maybe the critical call of the game, which was, it was third and five, I think from the 16 yard line and I could easily have said hey let's just run the ball put it in perfect position kick a field goal it'll put us up 26 20 but it had just happened to me against that team and against that quarterback I said that's not going to get it done so we decided to throw this was the biggest play of the game the biggest play of the season the window at 344 on the clock that comes down for the Jaguars to this third down play. And it's the biggest play of the game. We had an alert that if Jimmy got one-on-one -on -one with anybody, particularly if, it, if the DB was in press, he had the ability to convert that to a fade. Mark told me in the huddle, he said, Jimmy, we're going to run an extra read. If you get pressed, run a go. They were impressed. They were up on Jimmy. We knew what Mark knew right away what was going to happen. I just had to outmaneuver Tory James, change a couple of gears, give him a couple of change of speeds, and create the separation at the right time and make the catch. I remember looking up, and Jimmy goes out and makes that diving catch, and, and all of a sudden you realize that that was the biggest play of the season to this point, and the realization of what now we're on the verge of doing. Uh, it was uh, it was huge. I mean, it was the, the silence of the crowd was it was awesome. The Jaguars will not die. 
Three minutes and 39 seconds. That's all that remains, and Denver needs at least 10 points. They started using their timeouts when we had the ball, which was really interesting. And I can remember saying to Dick Duran, our defensive coordinator, I said, Dick, just make sure if they score, they score, you know, under two minutes. Three and a half minutes remain. The Broncos trail by 10. A palpable sense of despair envelops Mile High as John Elway desperately tried to beat the clock. That will be the final play before the two-minute warning. The Jaguars are two minutes from the AFC Championship game. They were called Jaguars in the paper this morning. They were referred to as that bunch from Redneck City, Jacksonville. And yet they've got the crowd stunned. 30-20, Jacksonville leads. Two minutes to go, Elway at the Jacksonville 15. Looks to the end zone, searching for an open man. Now he guns it. The Broncos scored with less than two minutes remaining. They had no timeouts left. Their only opportunity was a successful onside kick. I was hopeful, but in all my years in the National Football League, I have yet to be on a team that got an onside kick. And here it goes. It's right to Matson. And he plays for Jacksonville, and Jacksonville has the ball in the Denver 40-yard line. So a lot of hopes in this season going down the drain here for the Broncos. Stand on that sideline at 30-27 and watch Mark Brunel take kneel downs was gut-wrenching. Gut-wrenching because we knew we let our opportunity to represent the AFC in the World Championship game. We let it slip through our fingers. Oh, the victory formation. It's the best formation in football, especially when you're on the road at mile high, you know, against a team that's, uh, you know, number one seed. Now all of a sudden it's, you know, this thing is ours. We can actually, we're going to win this game. And uh, what an what a unbelievable feeling it was on the, on the sidelines. The Jaguars have done the improbable, and they have stunned John Elway. The noble warrior will go home without a championship again. If we can't beat Jacksonville at home, uh, in our backyard, who are heavy underdogs, if we can't beat them there, I don't want to go back to the Super Bowl and win it and lose again. So that was probably the most devastating loss that uh, I'd ever been through, including the Super Bowls, just because of where I was in my career in the 14th year. The Jaguars are going to the championship game of the American Football Conference. It was one of those moments where on the field, you know, you think, wow, did that just happen? I mean, did, did we really just win this football game? No one gave us a chance. And I think what makes it special is the fact that nobody gave us a chance. I remember me and T.D. were sitting on the sideline and just looking at the scoreboard and just believe. I'm looking at it. I cannot believe we lost this ball game. And T.D.'s like, man, Sean, what happened? What happened? Man, they beat us. I mean, it was almost like a dream. It was almost like all of a sudden, you didn't even hear the booze anymore. It's almost I didn't hear anything. Just T.D. I could only hear T.D.'s voice. And I remember telling him, man, let's go. I remember walking off the field and looking up to the corner of the fifth deck of Old Mile High Stadium, looking up and going, it doesn't get any better than this. For seven years of my career, you know, I had never experienced anything like that. This was the first time in my career that I was ever able to taste success in eight years. And I was damn sure going to enjoy every minute of it and to try to take in all the sights, all the sounds, and enjoy it as much as I could because I, I, I knew to appreciate that game. The Jacksonville Jaguars have upset Denver 30-27. to 27. The expansion Jacksonville Jaguars in only their second season in the NFL had defeated the Denver Broncos. It was a playoff win for the ages. It was a great locker room scene. It was a very exciting scene. 
Wayne Weaver, the owner, came in. He was uh, he was ecstatic. I can remember the media. The media was a little stunned, but boy, were they anxious to to get at the story. I remember Rick Riley saying something to me as to the effect of, uh, "Do you really comprehend what a monumental upset this is?" And and of course, you're trying to win a game. I'm trying to win a football game. I'm not thinking about history. I'm not thinking about any of that. But we had a smile kind of stuck on our face for a, a long, long time. The ultimate memory was the feeling afterward, on the field, in the locker room. I mean, that's why you play. You know, you, you uh, particularly when, again, when they, when they say you can't, you know, it's basically your team against everybody. And when you can accomplish something together, it's pretty special. One, two, three. They keep underestimating us. Why do you keep underestimating us? That's why you play the game because, you know, guys work so hard, you know, you know, for those moments, for those moments where you can celebrate amongst each other, you know, for a huge accomplishment. All love right here. All love right here. All love right here. It was just a great trip all the way back from, from Colorado to Florida. I remember the pilot coming over the intercom saying that we we're going to do a little, a little flyby uh, Jacksonville Stadium. The stadium still was half full. You could see a mass of people in the stadium. I don't know how many people were there. There had to be 20, 30, 40,000 people. I don't know. And they're waving and cheering and going on. And, and then we'd land at the airport and come back. It was almost like we won the Super Bowl. You know, it, 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 that's kind of how it felt. But it was just an amazing, an amazing time and uh, just an amazing game. For the Denver Broncos, the bitter disappointment of their playoff loss lingered immediately following the game and well after. I can remember lying in bed that, the night after the Jacksonville game and Mike, Mike actually called every coach that night, you know, and, and Mike being the type of guy he is, I can remember him saying, hey, I'm sorry, you know, he was feeling, we're like, hey, coach, <laughs> we're right there with you. We all knew, I mean, that was a devastating loss to that organization, a devastating loss. Of all the losses I've been a part of, that one bothered me the most in my 14-year career. The defeat proved to be a defining event in Broncos history. And Mike Shanahan made it very clear what was now expected. We think in those terms, good things are going to happen. The first speech Mike made, and this, this sums it up, and I'm telling you, when you're talking about putting in perspective, he said nothing less than a Super Bowl win. Not Super Bowl, not playoffs, a Super Bowl win will be acceptable. I'll say it until the day I die. Jacksonville Jaguars was probably the best thing. That loss is probably the best thing that ever happened to that organization. It was the toughest thing they ever had to go through, and it was the best thing that we ever had to go through. The one catalytic event that just created an atmosphere that basically pushed us to two world championships. A new look and a powerful sense of destiny draped the 1997 Broncos. For it was the Jaguars who again entered Mile High Stadium as Denver's first playoff opponent. Couldn't script it better. I mean, it was like straight out of NFL films. I'm telling you, literally, you could not script it better that Jacksonville was coming back to our house. We had to go through them to get to where we needed to be. That was one of those situations where we came in there and basically said, boys, we're going to run the football. We're going to show them who we are. We're going to cram it down your throat. This is what you're eating for dinner, and you're going to like it. This was Broncos football. 49 rushing attempts, 310 rushing yards. The demons of a playoff loss passed were exercised. <laughs> The road to the Super Bowl now seemed preordained. Go kick their Denver goes to the Super Bowl. They are the AFC champions. For the Broncos and their quarterback, the moment had arrived. John Elway, in his 15th NFL season, would seek redemption yet again. A perplexing legacy cloaked in shades of gray finally found sparkling clarity 
on a star-soaked Sunday night in San Diego. Greatest eight-yard run in Super Bowl history by John Elway. It was so exciting for me to watch John's face after that game was over with and to see the excitement in his eyes. The Super Bowl victory is much better than I ever thought it would be and relieved so much more pressure than I ever thought that I felt was on my shoulders. <laughs> I felt my career was legitimized and I no longer had to answer that question. Back to me was like it being born again, that I did not have to answer the question of what if you never win a Super Bowl? A second consecutive Super Bowl victory follows, further cementing Elway's place in NFL history. While both Elway and the Broncos achieved football immortality, the 1996 Jacksonville Jaguars believe they too could achieve something special. But the magic carpet ride ended in the AFC Championship game. Yet the prevailing sentiment was one of promise, of a future that beckoned with more and greater successes. I was disappointed because we didn't play great and we lost and had a chance to go to the Super Bowl, but as a young, dumb, second-year player, I said, we'll be back. Look how easy this was. We were four and seven when we made it this far. I mean, just get us in the playoffs. We know how to do this now. One, two, three, one, two, three. Oh, Over the next three seasons, Jacksonville was one of the best teams in the NFL. With a roster that featured some of the brightest young stars in the league, they won 36 games, including consecutive division titles in 1998 and 1999. Well, there goes back to bed. 14-2 AFC Central Champions, two years in a row, and the AFC number one seed. Yeah. In 1999, the Jaguars lost only two regular season games, both to the Tennessee Titans. They met for the third time in the AFC Championship game. Brunel rolls left, throws to the tight end ball, intercepted, Marcus Robertson! Touchdown, Titans! 80 yards, and Tennessee has surged in front! The Jaguars' fourth consecutive playoff season ended one game shy of the Super Bowl. Opportunity slipping away for Jacksonville here. Their chance to go to the Super Bowl in Atlanta. Slipping through their fingers. That was the end of a run, which I don't think anyone saw that then coming because we felt like we were pretty good coming back in 2000. 2000 was the first of three consecutive losing seasons. That would end the Tom Coughlin era in Jacksonville. A Jaguars team that rapidly ascended seemed to fall just as quickly. We were fortunate that we had a real good run, a lot of playoff years. We had a, we had a team that was able to stick together for a long time. But when we lost that game, we didn't think at all that, well, that was it, it's over. Yet, on one glorious Saturday afternoon in Denver, the Jacksonville Jaguars earned a lasting place in NFL playoff history. Their thrilling victory over the Broncos remains forever etched in the hearts and minds of those who accomplished the impossible. I don't even like to use the word upset, but it was one of the great games, you know, in, in my opinion, an all-time uh, professional football because of the nature of, of what was accomplished going in there. There's something about team, camaraderie, um, uh, overcoming adversity. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty special. It was by far the greatest game that I have ever played in, bar none. That moment will never be duplicated in franchise history, never.